like let me let me become an expert in this little area, an expert in this little area, and I have a passion for learning, and it makes it fun for me because it's just constantly an opportunity to grow. It's never, it's it's just endless. I still learn new things every day. You don't mind if I bring more special guests, do you? Is it okay? Are you tired of winning? Is it too much winning? More winning? Well, we have some more winning here. Today we brought Carla Esparza has made some time to come chat with us. And Carla is uh, current UFC champion at 115 pounds. She beat up a lot of the toughest girls, including a couple of my friends. <laughs> and. Um, and also as champion in the past, you were the first UFC champion at 115 pounds. You had a different belt before that. Was it Invicta belt yet or? Yeah, first ever Invicta FC first, belt. Yeah. First ever Invicta champion, first ever UFC champion at 115, and also the current UFC champion at 115. So it was easy, right? <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but um, made it happen yeah. <laughs> eight years later. Regained it. So has anybody done that? I don't. I don't think so. But um, but I, I don't. I don't know my history in that nuance. Has anybody uh, been a champion and then uh, later on regained their belt? A couple it, people in that in that way, like you know. Yeah, years actually, later? someone you know and train with, uh, Frank Near. He had the the record uh, below mine. He was uh, he he got he re he regained the belt. I think um, after three and a half or four years. Um, but this was definitely uh, almost eight years was the longest that anyone's ever lost a belt and come back and got it. So trying to stay at the top of this brutal spart has not been easy. Gangster. <laughs> so um, maybe you know, a couple bullet points on the on the way up of like, where, where did you start off with? For a lot of them are going to be curious. How, how did this start? You know, before championships, what's that grind like? Was there a lot of women MMA at the time? Were there a lot of women wrestling at the time? Yeah, I mean, there was hardly anything. I started wrestling on the boys' team in high school, so it was like the one girl on the team, you know, trying to survive on the team when, you know, everyone's like, you're going to quit, you know, she's just going to expect tre special treatment. So it's like having to prove yourself even more, and it was the same thing with MMA. There were, not like, hardly any women, and there was no, like, set criteria of how to succeed as a woman in the sport because there really wasn't much of it to speak of. It was almost like the wild, wild west. You had to take advantage of opportunities that came up, whether they were last minute fights or fights in different weight classes. You just had to do anything you could to, to, to grab those opportunities. I, I think something notable is there's, there's one thing that, you know, Carla's a true pioneer, you know, first UFC champion in that, her division, first Invicta champion. Women weren't even doing this shit when she started doing this. So there wasn't money. Were any women making money in this at that time? There was no money. No, I mean, you didn't, there was no money in the sport for women. There was no respect. You know, there was no, like, there were hardly any opportunities. I mean, you basically did it for the love and the grind of the sport. And, you know, there, I can imagine, I, I have plenty of internet people, that, meh, 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 meh. so I have autoresponders on almost all of my stuff now, even my email. Um, so I, I look at very little of this stuff now, but everybody has an opinion about uh, you know, me and you and anybody else that did anything ever. And I, I could imagine somebody thinking like, you know, oh, you know, she did that. Yeah, yeah, she was champion back in the day. You know, the skill set was different then. It was a different time. There was less competition. But eight years later, <laughs> but eight years later, and, and there is more competition. And it's a lot tougher. Would the skill set that won you their first title be sufficient to win a title today? Oh, definitely not. If I fought, if this Carla today fought the Carla the eight years ago, I would beat her ass. <laughs> She's scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, little little younger Carla don't want no trouble with current Carla. <laughs> you know, I was I was at Carla's fight um, a couple months ago when she won. Was that the end of? I forget the day. Is that end of April? It was uh, May 7th. Again, 
May 7th, first week of May. So I was at that fight, and there, you know, people have a commentary that, uh, you know, there's not the most exciting fight. Went five rounds, win by decision. And I, I thought to myself, you came to fight. And I got, you know, she fought Rose and I'm a Nunez. I hope I said her last name right. And I've, I've met Rose, and I know Rose. I have nothing bad to say about Rose. Rose, I think, is extremely talented. But you came to fight. You were aggressive. You're walking her down. You're, you're pursuing her. And um, the person I was with, again, I got nothing bad to say about Rose. I, we have, I, know, I know her. She knows me. We have a lot of mutual friends. But you came to fight that day, and she was playing a lot more defense and you know, trying not to engage. So Exactly. I thought that you know, any way that's a critic of that is like, you did your job. You did what you were supposed to do. And, and there's the result. You, you came to engage. So um, and I, I think it's great that uh, the changes in skill sets that have to happen. You know, what you did a decade ago to be a champion is insufficient to do that. And your skill set is so respected by, I think, one of the other very great female champions. I, th I think you'd agree that Rose is also one of the great female champions. Um, and she was very respectful and didn't want to engage with, with current Carla and the skills that you have. Yeah, most definitely. It's, it's so interesting because I felt that the wrestling and like the ground and pound and the skill set that I showed in the fights building up to this one, and it was actually a rematch. So the first time we fought, I had uh, finished her. I think I'm the only per person to ever finish Rose. Um, I, I ground and pounded her and then I choked her out. Um, but I think that fear mindset of what I did to her before and then possibly like the couple fights before, she just, I almost won the fight before I even stepped into the octagon because of my accomplishments beforehand. I'm not asking you, I'm not baiting you to say something controversial, but like objectively and respectfully, how, how did you feel about that at the time that when you're, you're pursuing and trying to engage and your opponent who's extremely talented and well-respected, you know, didn't have the same um, zest for engagement that you did? It, you know, like my coach always said, it's hard to fight someone who doesn't want to fight. You know, it takes two to dance, it takes two to tango. And, you know, you can't be out there fighting by yourself if someone's just not engaging with you. Um, you know, and it's, it sucks for the fans because you want to put on a good fight. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, if I walk away with the belt and, and, I, and I push the pace and I, and I was the aggressor, like, I'm content with I, what I did, but you know, um, at the end of the day, like I can't uh, can't cry over spilled milk and over what happened in the fight because it was out of my control what my opponent was doing. You know, she's very talented, and you know the you know, few things we said so far, I think, are exemplification of her skill set or dedication over time to 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 get a title, um, you know, lose that early in life, and you know, be not just keep up, but excel in a sport that's very rapidly changing, that's very rapidly changing that, uh, uh, in the past decade. Um, I think that's one part of who Carla is. And another thing that I would highlight is, Carla was supposed to be here yesterday. She was supposed to be our, our, our first guest yesterday. And what happened there is, um, you, you wanna tell that story? What's your experience been like with airplanes for the last couple of days? <laughs> Well, not one to complain, but uh, it's definitely been a rough ride uh, travel-wise. Flew from Dublin to London, and then our flight was uh, delayed, so we missed the connecting flight, and there was no flight going out until the following day. Trying to rebook a ticket, standing in line for six hours, and then being the last person at the counter to be told, come back tomorrow at four in the morning. Um, rebooking our ticket, finally making our way over, and then them losing our baggage and our next flight being delayed and almost missing our flight to Orange County and uh, getting home, sleeping for four hours and then popping over here, you know? But you make a commitment and you make it work. So Carla in the last couple of days, you know, is on a different continent, misses her flight, has to take a nap at the airport, take another nap at a, you know, a nap, like three hours or something you said at a hotel. Yeah. Back to the airport, get abused some more, Land, land back in the U.S. He had another flight delay. He land back in the U.S. in Phoenix, fly Phoenix to L.A., luckily, then, then L.A. to here, and, um, you know, and still shows up, everything's good. And communicated, didn't complain, 
didn't complain, didn't say, you know, hey man, maybe you, know, maybe you should schedule this for another time. Said nothing like that. Didn't say, hey, maybe you should schedule this for another time, Derek. Derek, don't you do events every three months or so? Maybe I could come to the next event, Derek. Didn't say anything like that. Didn't complain. And if anything, I think the, the tone of the communication was more like, you know, I hope you're not upset with me, but this is what I'm dealing with. And then, you know, us brainstorming together, like, well, how do we make the best of the circumstance? And, you know, I'd point to you, we were talking about integrity or the, the value of keeping your word or what that does for your, your personal branding and your public branding over time. And I think Carla's a person that really exemplifies that, that not a word of a complaint, not a, you just say, you know, hey, um, I'm trying to fix the problem. She, she was willing to come last night if I want. She said, like, Wait, I can get in town about 11 p.m., et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, maybe sleep. Maybe get a few hours of sleep and come today instead, you know? So I asked Valentina to come. And, and I'll make that point about, about my relationships. Is like, I don't know, Valentina's a pretty busy girl too, eh? Yeah. So to sure. be able to ask her to change her schedule, and uh, they don't know who the next speaker is, so let's not talk about that. But to be able to ask that person to change their schedule um, without them being fussy with me, it probably says something about the reputation I have with other people or you know, mutual friends or acquaintances. So I, I think that, and I'll give her 90% of the glory about this, 90% of that is about her, but we, and, and I'll take 10% because I'm so humble. Um, <laughs> probably the most humble. Um, but, you know, a, a tangent, wouldn't, wouldn't somebody have to know how great you are to understand just how humble you really are? If they didn't understand both, then probably the most humble. Um, but, you know, Carla's the type of person, is no complaints, no fuss. It's the biggest fight week of the year right now. The fights are going on right now. The biggest fight week of the year is right now. Maybe the, it's the biggest card of the year is right now, down the street. And, you know, just goes home, picks up her belt, shows up here to come sit with us. So think about that while, while she's in the room and think about that in your life going forward that, you know, there's 10 different reasons that she could make, uh, you know, an excuse or try to reschedule or, you know, or just say, hey, I can't make it. Sorry, fuck you. There's, you know, there's a lot of different ways she could handle that, but never a word of complaint, very constructive, very, you know, um, how, can, how can I solve this? Brainstorm it together, found a great solution, shift Valentina forward, shift another speaker a bit later. And I, you know, I, I know I've said this three times now today, but I really have a lot of respect for that, that I am the type of person that does that and nobody does that shit. So I have a lot of respect and a lot of appreciation that, that you made the effort to do that. And you know, thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank you. But I um, to relate that to, you know, something to do in my professional career, like in a fight, you know, there are constantly, you don't know what your opponent's going to come at you with. There's so many different things in MMA. Mixed martial arts is punches, kicks, grappling, you know, judo, wrestling. There's all these different things. So they can literally come at you with anything. And if you're not willing, if you're not able to, like, improvise in the moment, to improvise in the chaos then you're gonna catch yourself in a bad situation. And that's, that's life for me. You never know what's gonna be thrown at you, like could be this, that. You know, if you aren't able to improvise and kind of um, just push through the chaos and, and thrive in it, then, you know, you might find it hard to succeed. Totally agree. Then also today, after being sleep deprived for a few days, when's the last time you had like a real night's sleep? Like an actual, you could sleep eight hours if you wanted to. Four days or so, four or five days. It's been a few days, yeah. yeah. Then also, she has to show up for you know a UFC, um, you know, signing thing. You had a you know signing, sign people's stuff and smile for pictures and, uh, and then she had a, another ceremony today honoring here this, this jacket here that, um, you know, a few of my friends got these today, and, but uh, I get to see one in real life the same day. So this is for you know fifty tests, um, Asada tests which it means you, you know, she tested clean for you know, no uh, performance enhancing drugs. You know, you know better than I do, so correct me if I'm saying something wrong, but 50 clean tests with no, you know, performing, no, no picograms, no uh, performance enhancing anything in the system. So my buddy Ard Andre Arlovsky got one of these today. Uh, Joanna got one of these today. Who else did you know? Valentina. 
Valentina got hers too. Yeah. So Valentina got one today too. So. Chris Weidman. Yeah. So show up and sign autographs. You know, have a line of fans line, you know, lined up to see you. Go to a ceremony honoring her for her integrity and you know, not using drugs in her sport. And most important thing of the week, show up for the Moneybird event. So thank you very much. Um, I, I think I'll just do questions early and maybe that'll make the conversation flow natural. We've been chatting for hours together, so maybe that's what, what's gonna help the conversation flow most naturally. What are a few things that you folks would think about that uh, she and I might be able to help you with? What do you think of David? For me, it's, it's hard to, to connect with the right people and bring build up a new friend circle because I have an old friend circle which is different mindset. How do you build such an incredible uh, circle of people that are supportive of you and that you're supportive of them? That's something I feel uh, I find very amazing. I'll go back to this example of the you know Carla, somebody that I like and had respect for. Uh, we don't know each other a long time. We have, you know, ten mutual friends, real friends, and you know, a hundred people that we both know, you know, acquaintances. Um, but I think she's really gone above and beyond that. Most people with the relationship we have and with the circumstances that she's been experiencing wouldn't show up. And you know, Carla's got a new friend with me that for somebody that behaves that way, there's so few people that behave that way. Uh, and you, and some of you know me for a decade, so you know how fucking fussy I am about this. That if somebody cancels plans with me one time, I don't give a fuck who it is. I don't care if, I don't care if they're a billionaire. I don't care if they're, I don't care who it is. I just, I, I don't like when somebody um, has that thoughtlessness about you know, my time or my schedule, and I just don't wanna spend time with them again. Not necessarily, you know, mad, mad at them. Um, I'm mad for three seconds. I'm like, okay, that guy. And then, um, but, I, but I'm not making plans again. We're not going to reschedule. We're not going to do. All right. So, I think that, you know that, that that sort of you know a comment she's made a couple times today is, is uh, you know about I think he said my my word is my bond is I think that's what you said, and you know but she's exemplified that this week with a lot of other you know, externalities in the environment. So um, Carla and I knew each other decently before this and you know, had, I think we were both endorsed by other friends that we both know. But I, I think of her as a friend. I think of her, her husband as whether he went along willingly with this and participated or was just uh, subject to uh, her saying, no, this is what we're doing. I'm not, I'm, I'm probably a bit of both, <laughs> probably a bit of both. but. Um, they could call me and ask me for about anything, and um, yeah, we'd probably do it. So I, I, th I think that's having that sort of respect for other people. Um, you know, it leaves an impression on the few people that are, the, that are that way themselves. And if you don't do that, then your you know your reputation is very different. If you don't keep your word, if you don't, um, I mean, you're, you're going to have plenty of company with a bunch of bums, but. You're not going to be allowed in social circles where it's it's important that you keep your word. It's important that you have, you know, dis discretion to uh, help people in certain ways or not say certain things. Or if you don't have the social awareness or integrity to do that, it's going to be very difficult to be at the top of any sort of social hierarchy. Or you know, and one component I'm very curious about your opinion. One reason that I keep my word a lot is not because I'm such a fucking nice guy, and I, I don't pretend that I'm such a I'm not an altruist. I don't want to save the world. You know, I, I want to help uh, a few thousand people that are serious about saving themselves. I'd like to help those people to have a better life. But I'm not one of these guys. I want to help everybody. I don't like most people. I don't want to. I want. I want to stay far away from most people. But if for for my own selfishness, if nothing else, it's it's. I'm nicer than that. But I'm saying it in the harshest possible way. If for no other reason, out of your own selfishness, if you knew the value of keeping your word consistently and the, the benefits that'll get you over time. You know, even, even people much more, um, much less altruistic with me than me would start doing that. If they knew the long-term returns of that, they would do it out of sheer selfishness that, you know, and then and I say one more comment is like, I have to know when I go look at somebody, when I go meet a, a stranger that whoever they are, if it's um, when I was a single guy that might've been a pretty girl, 
when, uh, you know, today that might be a, a business person or a person of interest, like, you know, oh, he's interesting or she's interesting, like I should interview them or we should do this or that together. When I go look at, when I go talk to that person in real life, I have to be able to look them in their eyes and it has to be unwavering and it has to be like, they have to understand that like, oh, this, this guy's not full of shit. That almost everybody's full of shit. And you know, you can see that in a second when you look at, you know, women are better at this than men are, that you're pretty quick at assessing, is this somebody that I should pay attention to and have a conversation with or best to just keep it moving right now? That, how do you think about that sort of thing? I, I, last thought, out of, my, out of my own selfishness, because if you start lying to, to your, your, you start lying to other people or breaking your word with other people, and then there's more lies, and then you're lying to yourself, and then you're not getting things done, and then you don't have that same confidence to go talk to someone or, or be, you know, can you, could you be on stage and you know, have your, your stare down with your opponent, knowing that you did a shitty, you, know, you did a shit work camp, your diet sucks, you know, several, there's 10 holes that you had control of that you know you could have and should have fixed. Are you gonna have the same confidence in that moment? No way. Yeah, I'm very long winded, but that, did that make sense what I said? Yeah, most definitely. How do you think about this general topic? I, I mean, I, I, I agree. Um, I think you kind of, you get what you put out and, you know, it's almost like the age old saying, treat others how you want to be treated. And it, like you said, in the long run, it could be selfish because you're treating people with good respect and, and you're treating them great and you're getting all these things back, at least from the right people that you want to keep around. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, just keeping your word and, you know, being respectful of people's time because I value my own time. So I don't want to waste other people's time. So yeah, it's super important for me to like follow through with my commitments, follow through with my word and just treat people the way I want to be treated. To, to the other part of his question of, you know, how to, how to build um, high quality social networks or how to be accepted by, by other winners, other high quality people. What are some thoughts you have around that general topic? Um, for me, I, I try to surround myself around people who I admire, who I'm like, I do they, they're willing to be my friend. If anything, I go in above and beyond to, to show up and put the extra mile in, be the extra, like the, the better friend, the best friend I can be to them, you know, because I'm trying to make myself worthy for that person, that situation. And then I feel like surrounding myself with that type of person, eventually I'm building myself up to that, to be on their level. You know, you, you've heard me say this different times, but um, I, I feel the same way that I want to be around you know other people that I that I respect, people that I admire for something that um, you know you, you'd like to emulate some part of their life, or you know it kind of rubs off on you. And we talked about this previously that um, when you're the old Epictetus adage that you're you're going to be like the people that you surround yourself with. Like it's not a choice. It's like it's humans are, are permeable creatures that you're going to be like the people that you associate with. And, you know, to maybe a final you know, nuance about your questions, like if you don't keep your word with those people, you're not going to be allowed to associate with the best people that perhaps you could have. And you're not going to get the, the endorsements from them to, you know, to have access to the other quality people in their peer group. And you're not going to get the endorsements from them to have access to the other quality people in their peer group and so on and so on and so on. And you know, it's a small world. There's, you know, there's 10,000 or 100,000 people in the world that you'd actually like to spend time with. You don't have time for all of them, but it's, it's a small world. And those, those people tend to know each other or be you know, one introduction away from each other. And uh, when, you start doing, when you start doing things that don't reflect well on your integrity, um, other people hear about that. When you start, you know, I've, I've gone out of my way at least twice today, you know, at least three times, in an interview that she and I did earlier and with another mutual friend that we spent time with just before we walked in here and in front of my own group and on YouTube. I've gone out of my way to highlight that, you know, I thought that you really went above and beyond and, and showed exceptional integrity. And, and I wanted to honor that, that there's so few people that behave that way that, um, and most of my friends behave that way, but in the population, it's damn near nobody. So I wanted to show my respect and honor for that um, proactively. That. So, yeah, you get it. What are you thinking, Tim? First of all, thank you guys very much for the talk. Really appreciate that. 
like two things really stood out to me. Like on the one hand, I think in a situation where there's a lot of chaos, this is actually a great opportunity on the one hand to find out about another person's true personality. And on the other hand, to also prove your own credibility to your loyalty to a person when there's like a really fucked up time where you where it actually matters that you stand by the side of that person. And the question that I have, I think it's really fair to say, or maybe even not maybe, it's it, it is an understatement to say that you're both really successful. So we're doing okay, huh? <laughs> what is it? that how do you still keep that hunger and the aggressiveness still up and that you still want to do more and more and more hard stuff and to get to the even higher to the top while still already being very, very successful? I'll answer the question, but let's give her a little context. Her husband is a doctor and my, my friend here is a doctor also. And maybe give her a little context of your dilemma with um, you know, finished medical school, finished his residency. Father's a doctor, so he has the pressure to go be a doctor. And uh, how's that going for you? The last couple of years went very, very well. Like the stock market crash in 2020, and Derek helped me like, let me say it like that. Derek always says like, you don't go to war with the army that you wish you had, but you go to war with the army that you built during peace times. And I had no army. Derek was very kind to borrow me some nuclear bombs, I would say. <laughs> and um, yeah, we, we made a lot of money in the last two years. And on the other hand, I also finished studying in 2020. So this is, I would say, the dilemma that uh, on the one hand, there's a lot of peer pressure to work as a doctor. But I currently, you know, everything works out so well that I make way more money from stocks than I do than I actually would if I would start to work as a doctor. I still feel a lot of pressure to be a doctor, but on the other hand, like first of all, this situation currently is like so unique, and I realize it myself that it will be so dumb if I do not, you know, take advantage of this situation. But still, like uh, it's it's tough. It's tough. I know everybody else from the outside would say, bro, just do it. You know what you do. But I, I still have to say that I struggle a little bit with that. So for me, it was, I genuinely like have a passion and love for what I'm doing. But I also know that it's so endless the things that I can learn. Like I have been doing this for 20 years and I think I could do this 100 more and still not know it all. Um, I have a passion of learning, of taking apart like the small things and and have a passion of like, it's almost like a, a competition of like learning in those little areas. It's like these constant little competitions, of like let me, let me become an expert in this little area, an expert in this little area. And I have a passion for learning and it makes it fun for me because it's just constantly an opportunity to grow. It's never, it's, it's just endless. I, you, know, you know what I'll say is you know, I, I still learn new things every day that um, I, I, I was very frustrated in my childhood. I, I didn't like the environment that I grew up in. And um, I really hated that. I didn't just not like it, but I really hated that. And I was like, kind of whatever it takes to make a better situation. And I had that in my head for so long. And I, I got, you know, you fumble around and you mess a lot of things up by yourself. Or I did that I didn't have, I didn't have any real positive role models. I had a lot of negative role models that you look at someone and you're like, well, I'm not doing that shit. And that doesn't seem to work out well. So, you know, there's a few things that you're like, you know, heroin is not for me. I've seen how that ends, you know? So things like that that I had, that, and that, that's useful, but I didn't really have good positive role models. And I spent a lot of time working. I spent, you know, more than a decade just trying to, maybe this is relatable to you, but to kind of, uh, to earn a good coach or earn a good mentor or, you know, find somebody that, at least was doing something right and could point you in the right direction. And I always made sure that if somebody, um, somebody that I thought was smarter than me or had a better, um, you know, could see some things down the road that I, that I wasn't old enough or smart enough to see yet, if they, if they, someone sincerely tried to help me or point me in the right direction, I wanted to make sure that I did that. I wanted to make sure that I did my part so I could come back and say, hey, I got a little result, you know, what do you think I should do next? So. 
it took me a long time to get, um, I mean, it, it took me my whole childhood and most of my 20s to, to go build those type of relationships and, and be, have people that cared enough that they knew that you'd show up and perform, so they take some time out of their life to help you. And I'm sure you had some coaching situation like this, that somebody that you wanted to work with or somebody that you, you knew they could get, help you get to the next step. And, but you still got to show up and do your part and earn that spot because a lot of other people probably want to work with them too. Does yeah, that make sense? Most definitely. My head coach now that I've been with for 16 years didn't talk to me for two years. <laughs> and I finally, after a couple of years, I got a, a couple more years, I got a good job. And I was just so excited and stoked. But the more that he saw that I showed up and put in the work, the more he wanted to give that back to me. And to answer his question, that I think I worked so damn hard to get that to, to begin with, that after you have that momentum, why would I ever want to stop that momentum? Why would you ever want to stop the winning? You already did all the hard work. You have the momentum. You just have to show up and do what you've been doing. And, you know, the good things will continue. And not every day. Everybody has bad days. Everybody has, you know, some, some shitty something comes up every day for me. Um, I doubt every day of your life is, I know that not, I know from this week that not every moment is perfect or ideal. And that's life. So, you know, I think that's a problem some people have is like they think everything's going to be beautiful and pretty. And it's, it's not really how life is. It's what she said, when you have setbacks and difficulties and like, all right, you know, how do we stay focused and work around this? How do we overcome the obstacle to get to the goal? And, um, no, I would just say that, you know, after you, if you've gone through the effort as you've had, as you have already, to, you know, get in a, a habit of, you know, building successful patterns and, you know, quite literally get in the habit of winning, get in the habit of building more success, um, why would you ever want to interrupt the process? Why would you ever want to interrupt the compounding? So in my head, it's not like a, a motivation question of, you know, oh, how do you keep going? Like it's like it's some like arduous grind inside. Like, yeah, some days it is. I, I wake up with three hours of sleep. I slept four and a half hours last night. And that's fine. That's nobody cares, nor should they. But, you know, sometimes I wake up, you know, once a week I wake up and I'm like, oh, I, I don't feel like doing the thing I'm supposed to do right now. And then I remind myself, well, the success gods, they don't give a shit what I feel like. The money gods don't have any opinion about my feelings, but... You know, the, the success gods seem to be very attentive to the results that one achieves, you know? If you're willing to show up and put in the work consistently. Uh, and, and that's been a theme here, is talking about consistency over time. You know, if you show up and put, up, put in the work consistently, most people won't. And that by itself puts you in a different league than other people are maybe a top competitor, but they don't have the same dis discipline or the same dedication of, um, you know, looking at their long-term goals over their short-term feelings. If we all listen to our short-term feelings, nobody here would do anything. There's a lot of people here that are business owners and you know, PhDs and lawyers and so on. Um, if, you, if you cared about your short-term emotions more than your goals, n none of us would have done anything. <laughs> so it's, I still laugh at myself about those sort of things. But, well, I don't feel like it. And then I laugh and I'm like, well, Success guys don't care what I feel like. Just go do the thing you're supposed to do. But maybe you have a different thought on that. No, I have the same thoughts. You know, a lot of days it gets rough and you don't want to show up. It's, in my line of work, it's like, this is hurt, that's hurt, that's hurt, that's hurt. I'm icing up. I feel terrible. Mentally, I'm kind of broken down. But it's like, you got to show up. And nobody's, you know, keeping you accountable necessarily. It's like, you have to be so self-accountable, and that's why a lot of people don't succeed in the sport that I'm in because we don't have fines for not showing up for practice. If you don't show up, you don't get better, and nobody's going to reprimand you for that. You're not going to get in trouble, but you're not going to get that much better because you didn't put in the work. It's the work that you do when nobody's looking for me that has brought me the most success. I don't see my main coaches for, you know, there's 25 days in between. So I say, you know, Jake is my most, he's the guy that helps me tie everything together. I work on a lot of things in between, and I generally don't see him for 25 days. And then he comes back, and we work for 10 or 12 hours, and um, he goes away for another 25 days. You think he doesn't know if I've been working hard or not the last 25 days? You think he's, you know, somebody that's as talented as, as you or him, like, you know, how long would it take for you to make an assessment if 
Uh, it's not like he's giving me homework, but it's not even like he's telling me to do the things I'm doing. He's, he's not pushing me to do these things, but he would clearly see the difference that, you know, the three weeks that he was gone, what was I doing with other people during that time? Was I practicing the things? Was I doing, how long would it take you to make an assessment uh, to see if like, you know, in the last 25 days, has this guy been chilling or has he been working aggressively, you know, building on that skill set? It's obvious pretty quickly. A few minutes? Yeah. Maybe less than a minute, depending. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no fine if we're not showing up, but, but you're not going to get the results. What else? Um, the question that I had is how both how do both of you approach the art of learning the fundamentals from those that came before you that worked in a specific context and also at the same time looking to innovate to make sure that the things that you're doing make you successful in the new environment that you're in, be that in business or in fighting or in different sports. How do you guys reconcile that art because you can't be binary in it? I think there's tremendous overlap in, in that thought process. Uh, you know, I, I think um, a person who tries to do the, the fancy, cute shit, the, the new trendy thing without having a, a really solid mastery of fundamentals is you know, they're putting themselves in danger, whether that's in entrepreneurship or investing or in fighting. Um, and, you know, I don't think you'll disagree with this, but uh, feel free. But I, 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 I've spent so much time thinking about, you know, what, what are the basic key first principles that you, you, know, you always have to do in business? And if you really understand that deeply, which, you know, maybe only took me 30 years to have, and I can learn a lot more, I'll agree with what you said. I can learn if I could learn more than you know a thousand more years, I still be learning something. So I understand a little bit of what there is to know about business. Buffett says he understands like two percent of what there is to know about business, and he has a similar IQ, and he's fifty years older than me. So maybe I understand one percent. Um, but yeah, if you don't understand those fundamentals and you try to do some cute trendy shit, um, I haven't seen that work out well for people. And I've taken that philosophy that's, that's helped me a lot in business and investing. And with my training in MMA, which you know, she obviously is a much higher level expert than, than I'm ever gonna be in that area. But um, I, don't, I don't argue with, uh, I never try to rush things. You know, with, when a coach is trying to teach me something, if anything, I'm slowing things down. I don't need to learn six new things right now. If I could learn like one and a half of them really clean, like, you know, beautiful, and then I'll keep that. And then, you know, I'll work on that and refine it and a couple new things will come up. And if we can refine those few things and learn one and a half new things, you know, I, I feel like that's really great progress and I can retain it and it's sustainable and I have a great foundation to build on. But I'm not asking anybody, you know, show me the new trendy bullshit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How do, how do you think about that? Um, I guess I think about it uh, by the way I figure out if it works is... I tested in, in the fire, you know, I tested in competition, I tested out there because that's the only way that you really know if this is gonna work because it's easy to try something when it's slow and easy, but you know, when you're really out there and seeing what works and what doesn't, it's just so much trial and error. Um, but I definitely try it in training as much as possible to get it refined. Um, but as far as the fundamentals go, I still go to beginner classes, I still, will sit there and analyze the most simple basic move and work on that for hours because there are so many little details that can make it perfect. And at the end of the day, these fundamental principles and moves are the things that are gonna be, give you the most success in, in martial arts. What about the new trendy thing though? The new trending thing, um, for me, those are flashy and they're fun and they look cool, but very low percentage of actually pulling it off. You know, it's a lot of bells and whistles, and it might look fun to pull it off, but if at the end of the day I'm doing the fundamentals and I'm getting my hand raised, I'm going to stick with that. Um, but, but I saw the new trendy thing on Instagram, and <laughs> the people in the comments, they seemed really smart. They said it well, looked cool. When, if you can pull that off, I'm like, if I can pull this off one out of a thousand times, this spinning backflip, upside down, rolling over thing, then I'm going to look amazing. But nine, nine times out of a hundred, I'm going to end up on my back and get ground pounded. 
I think I'm going to stick with the uh -oh. fundamentals. Oh, <laughs> yeah, interesting. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Derek. Thank you, Carlos, for being here. Uh, Derek, you've helped me make many profound psycho psychological shifts over the years, which have resulted in tremendous growth in my business and uh, just myself and my ability to execute. Um, one thing that, that came up in what you were saying, Carla, and I know this is very true of you, Derek, as well, you know, you had some early success and you had that competitive drive sort of from the beginning, and then you had some setbacks. And I'm really curious, you know, what sort of happened after that? What psychological shifts did you make that allowed you to come back and put in that extra 10 years of work to get back on top and then, then go beyond what you'd ever achieved? I can just answer in bullet points that they, you know, you, you've heard me talk about this before, but you know, I, I made um, a notable amount of money, you know, in my late teens, and I found a way to turn that into zero. And then uh, I made another, you know, inflation adjusted five, six hundred grand in my early twenties, and then I found a way to turn that into zero, negative. I found a way to turn that into a negative net worth. I remember being twenty-six years old. I was in Chicago. I was walking on Michigan Avenue. There's a Neiman Marcus store, and there's a homeless guy in front of the store. And I took a few more steps. It was winter time. It was cold. I was by myself. I took a couple more steps, and I, and I, I physically stopped because I had a little click in my head. I physically stopped, and I thought to myself, um, "You're a quarter million dollars in debt. That mom is richer than you are right now." And I, I didn't like that. <laughs> Um, but I, I like reality more than I like to tell myself some fairy tale shit, though. So I always had a strong bias towards that. The more you could, you know, accept, the more clear your perception of objective reality, which you'll never have a totally full perspective of. But the more the more in touch you are with reality, the better positioned you are to have better outcomes. That you know the things you need to fit. You know the things you're good at. You know how to improve them. You know where to spend your time to get. You know, should we work on that more? Probably let's keep that tight and build up some other things and so on and so on. So, you know, yeah, I think I got tired of getting my ass handed to me a couple times. And, um, you know, I was a lot more mindful of, um, you know, people want to think about offense in business, they, you know, especially in stocks. They want to think offense, 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 but make money, make money, make money. Um, I, I started understanding defense better, too, of like, let's not do stupid shit or, Let's think more more clear, clearly about the you know statistical outcomes of various investments or behaviors in entrepreneurship or or investing. Um, so yeah, I just got tired of getting my ass kicked, and I thought, well, let's be you know stop stop trying to hit all home runs, and you know maybe let's do some things that are consistently good, consistently good and going to make money, and be well prepared. To his point and be well prepared for where there's a great opportunity in the market where you have, you know, the, the odds are very much in your favor that you've been training to do the spinning, twisting, backflip, kick thingy. And you're like, you know, oh, this is the one time that that'll clearly work actually. And, and, and that took me from, you know, negative net worth at 26. I had my first million dollar net worth by 29. And I had a few million dollar net worth in my early 30s, 32, 33, and you know, 11-ish million dollar net worth going into this last recession and 50-something million dollar net worth after that and you know and probably in probably 46 47 million dollar net worth today after getting uh you know the last six months the market's down more and i'm doing better than the market is but i'm still down you know close to nine million dollars with it i missed that nine million dollars more than i can tell you more than some family members i've had um so I think I got tired of doing that, and I'd say, well, let's play more defense in some ways. We're consistently winning and having incremental growth, for sure. And I did more prep work. Went, I went back to graduate school. I didn't have to go to graduate school. I haven't had a job since I was 19. I didn't need to go to graduate school. The last thing I wanted is a job. I wanted to go learn stuff from the other super nerds there, you know, and, and so on and so on. So I think I got tired of getting my ass handed to me and... Um, just wanted to make sure there was a more consistent path forward. <laughs> Turned out okay so far. How do you think about this type of thing? Setbacks and having having initial success and then setbacks and then moving forward and having more tremendous success. Well, as an athlete, you know, staying at the top for a long time is a difficult thing and 
in fighting, when you lose, you feel your losses. You train for months and you just get your ass beat. And that sucks. Um, for me, first time in my career, I had two losses and I had already lost the belt. I was just like, you know, fortunately with fighting, you we have footage to literally look at and be like, you suck there, there, and there. But there's also other places, you know, to make adjustments. Um, for me, when I had my biggest loss, um, I went on and I had to change my mental, I had to change my nutrition, I had to change my skill set and go back to being a beginner. I went back after that and I readjusted instead of feeling like I'm in the room and I'm, you know, a brown belt or I know everything, I had to go back to being white belt and having like this learning mentality, this listening mentality and changing the way I'm hearing things and the way I'm receiving them and things that I weren't willing, I wasn't willing to try before. I was like, nah, I'm not gonna do that. It's like, I had to be more open-minded and really change my thought process. And for me, that's what helped me evolve and get on. Now I think it's a six or a seven fight win streak to, to retain this belt. So that was the big evolution that I had to make uh, six years ago to kind of come back at, from my setbacks. Um, the question I have for both of you is, what were the things that you had to say no to in order to achieve the two or three things that you really, really wanted? I know a guy that asked questions like that. Um, I'll let you go first. They know more of the answers from me, but what are, what are some of the things you had to say no to to say yes to the things that you wanted most? I, to be totally honest, I had to say no to fun. That was friends, that was relationships, that was uh, food I wanted to eat, that was going out with friends, that was drinking, that was all of these sacrifices that you have to make basically you have to live, I had to live like a hermit and I had to be super selfish. And that was the huge thing, huge thing for me over the years. I mean, um, I don't have a, like a kids at this point and for me because I had to completely dedicate everything to being as great as I possibly could. And, um, and I knew I had to be selfish. So for me, all the things I had to say no to were basically all the fun stuff. <laughs> Were those sacrifices or investments? They were investments. I don't mean to play like a linguistics game there, but I thought about that. I used to do that to myself and say, no, you know, it feels like you have a sense of loss internally when you say like, I have to give up this, I have to give up that, I had to sacrifice this thing. And just changing that thought in my mind, it helped me an awful lot. And I've shared that with a few other people that I'm not into any kind of woo-woo, jibber-jibber, like I'm so far away from that sort of thing, but play with that in your, your psychology a little bit. Like Both statements maybe are true, but I think it's even a more true statement to say that rather than say sacrifice, you know, fit in the word investment in that same context of like, no, I made a, a further investment that my competition likely would not make to have a higher probability of success. And does that make sense? Yeah. For sure. No, that's very true. Maybe I can be a sports psychologist. Someday. <laughs> Maybe I should lose another 20 pounds first. Um, no, I had the same thought. I had a lot of um, I had a lot of negative mindsets, especially earlier. I wasn't always this cheery. Um, that's an ongoing joke with my community. That I'm always equally grumpy and cheery at the same time. My moods are very even, but I'm always a little bit grumpy and a little bit cheery at all times. Um, I wasn't always this cheery though. And yeah, I mean, earlier I had a, a lot of negative self-talk. Um, through all of my 20s, I had a lot of negative self-talk. A game that I would play with myself that just doing normal things, you know, you're, you slept three hours. I need three hours of sleep, so that's the number I always go back to. That I need, and there's times I did less than that, but I need three hours to function, kind of, you know? And you know, you, you wake up and you're like, well, I got this opportunity or I got this thing to do, thing that I should do, thing that I could do that would be a positive opportunity. And your emotional brain says like, you know, hey, maybe roll over and go back to sleep. And my, the more aggressive part of my brain would ask the question, I tormented myself with this way more than 10,000 times, you know, are, are you behaving like a champ or a chump right now? And I'd create that false dichotomy game, or you know, are you engaging in the behaviors that would lead to a champion outcome, 
or just some Trump, just some 50th percentile normal people stuff. And no, I, I, got a lot of, I got a lot done thinking that way. It's not, it didn't feel pleasant emotionally, but I got a lot done thinking that way. You know? And you, know, you ask yourself that numerous times per day that when a, when a mere mortal might take a break, say, well, who would take the break right now, a champ or a chump? Okay, then engage in the behavior that would lead to the higher quality outcome. And that, that paid off for me for, I'm grateful that I did. I didn't have a better model at that time. So in lieu of a better model, I'm happy I used that model. In my, my early 30s, I thought to myself, well, so this is more positive self-talk. I thought to myself, hey, dickhead, you know, you got a pretty good track record of getting things done. You got a pretty tra good track record of showing up, doing difficult things, et cetera, getting outcomes. Since you have a good track record of doing that, maybe you don't need to have such negative thoughts in your head. Maybe, maybe you could just you know, uh, shift that thought to be like, I might as well be in the best mood that I can be in. I'm going to do the thing anyway. So I might as well be in the best possible mood that I can conjure to put myself in while I'm doing the thing and experience uh, you know, the best emotions that I could while doing the thing that I know I'm supposed to do. And I, I found when I did that, that it freed up a bit more energy that felt a little lighter, felt a little more joyous, and it allowed me to work harder even. It allowed me, I had, I had some additional capacity that I didn't previously have under that other model. Now I wish I had this improved model earlier, but I didn't. And you know, for somebody to ask me of like, well, you know, Derek, if, if I can't make myself feel good, all right, well then feel bad and do it then feel bad and do it, but try to move towards a better model that, I'd, I'd rather feel bad and do it and get the result than not do the thing, because you'll feel worse later in my opinion. But um, I, I would encourage you that, you know, be, be resigned to do the thing that you know will get to your goal. Remember that it's your goal. It's your damn goal, nobody else is making you do something. I'm not making you do something. You set the goal. Do you really want it though? Do you really want it? and then do the thing that you need to do. And you might as well be in the best mood that you can be in while doing that. And if you can't muster a good mood at that moment, then be in a bad mood and do it, but also be conscious of like, all right, you know, I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, as soon as you have an acceptance of that, I'm gonna do it anyway, that, you, that you're just, hey, I'm doing it anyway. You know, that, that makes it easier when you stop having that internal battle, should I do it, should I do an 80% job today? Could I do a 91%? When you, start when you stop negotiating your, with yourself that way or having that type of internal dialogue, then you can get to the part of, hey, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it 100%. It doesn't matter how I feel. I'm going to do it anyway. And about the time you come to acceptance with that, then you can be a little more lighthearted that you made the decision. You're going to do it. You're going to make the best of it. And if you can be in a good mindset or you know, a generally positive mindset or find the joy of, like, I get to do the thing or this is a cool opportunity that I'm grateful I have the opportunity to do this thing. You know, I had to work harder earlier in life where I wouldn't have an opportunity like this to go do this thing. So if you, you know, th that's helped me a lot. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. How, how do you think about those sort of things? Um, I guess uh, every time I'm in training, suffering, or I'm like, I have somebody putting me in a really tough spot and I'm just struggling, I, I, I do feel like I'm like, okay, but it's learning to be in these tough situations and work my way out of them that you know, helps me grow mentally. So, yeah, I definitely feel, I agree. A conversation we were having last night was uh, along the, the topic of, and it was with a, another um, you know, former champion fighter. There's a lot of situations that are uncomfortable, but, you know, you, you, I can have, even for my own training, and, you know, again, I, I reiterate, I, I, I don't pretend that she and I have anything like a similar skill set. This is my new hobby. This is something that she's best in the world at, you know, in, in her category. So to me, it's a hobby. It's, to her, it's been a multi-decade career. So, but it, so you, I, I keep that frame in mind and you know, be aware that I have that awareness as well. But sometimes when I feel really uncomfortable, I have a lot of weight on me or somebody's giving me a rough time and like a, a normal person, a normal person would never do this to begin with. But then, you know, a kind of tough person would want to give up about then. And I feel like giving up sometimes. And then you kind of have to have a talk with myself, well feeling miserable. Um, you know, are you know, are you going to be permanently injured from this? 
Are you going to have, you know, is this going to cause a knee or elbow or is it going to cause a joint injury? Is it going to cause a broken rib? Is it going to cause some brain damage? No. So, oh, so you're just uncomfortable. You're not actually being harmed. You're just feeling very uncomfortable. So, oh, well, maybe just to, you know, adjust your position. Try to get a little breath of air. And, you know, you've spent more, much more time in those circumstances than I have, but that's given me a, a, a different perspective for other things, you know, business related and other things as well, that it's another perspective of endurance or tolerating uncomfortable situations and the growth that comes from that. Yeah, I actually seek out the uncomfortable at training. It's like, I, I'm terrible in this area. So, you know, it's fun to train the things that I'm good at because it's easy and I'm better than people at that and I can get past the day easy. But when I'm sitting there doing something I'm not good at and someone's just mentally beating me because they're better than me and physically beating me because I'm a female and I'm the, always the smallest in the room, I'm just, in my head, I know that, you know, not only am I learning how to, am I learning how to deal with this technically, but mentally getting like pushed and beat up in training is something like that's kind of replicating what could happen in a fight. I've definitely been in a lot of situations in a fight where I'm just getting ground and pounded or beat beat up really bad. And it's those, those practice situations of being in these, you know, very frustrating situations that kind of help me in the actual fight. It's like, I know how to be uncomfortable. I don't like it, but I can weather the storm and I can, I actually know how to think when I'm being attacked because I'm so used to doing it and putting myself in that situation. So that's kind of helped me a lot of times when I've been literally like, a lot of people would have quit and I'm like, oh no, keep moving. All you gotta do is take this step, take this step because I was so used to being there already. And a lot of, uh, many times I've actually won fights because of those moments that I didn't quit and that I was able to mentally push through. I encourage them to make a, you know, I tell them, they, a lot of people ask me for help with negotiating something. And I said, well, negotiation is a lifestyle. It's not something that, um, and negotiation starts at, you know, what are the components of negotiation or some of the components? You have to be a good communicator. You have to be a pretty good psychologist. If, you, if you're not empathetic enough or intelligent enough to understand, you know, what is your counterparty thinking or feeling and what are their interests, and how would we come to a resolution that would be a win-win, then um, it's, it's hard to get to that resolution. You know, if, you're, if you just think, I want, I want, I want, it's like, like, that's what like a baby thinks. Like a baby thinks about, I want, I want, and it cries and it flops around and, you know. Um, nobody's coming to save you, you're an adult. M mommy might have picked you up and tapped you on the back or something when you were a little baby and gave you a nipple or a bottle or something, but as an adult, nobody's coming to do that shit for you. So you can think, you know, I want, I want, I want, but you're going to have worse outcomes than you did as a baby because nobody cares anymore. So, you know, the sooner you can get to the thought of how could I help someone else accomplish their goals? You know, what is my counterparty interested in here? Is there, is there a space between us that we can both win here that, um, um, you know, there's a foundation for a quality relationship in the future? But the other, another element very important about negotiation is feeling uncomfortable, is feeling you know, socially uncomfortable or having psychological pressure uh, of doing things that you, you could avoid some little something right now and just pay a little more money or tolerate a little abuse that probably was unfair or not nice, but, or somebody's treating you a little unreasonable and you're like, mm, okay, I'll just go along with it. I think that's a mistake. I think it's and not from an egoic perspective, but from the same type of perspective that you said, that like, if you're not willing to, if you're not willing to be firm in your personality when somebody's obviously trying to bully you a bit, you know, in life or in a negotiation, how the hell are you gonna have the best outcomes when, you know, if you can't negotiate for like, I don't know, your change back in a third world country, you paid for a transaction and they wanna, you know, she's had this experience, I see your face. If you can't get your change back that you're rightfully supposed to have, how are you supposed to negotiate a multi-million dollar something? If you, you know, you, those type of situations. If you're at the airport and somebody like literally pushes you and tries to cut in front of you in line, say, you know, hey, I'm gonna be late for my flight and literally pushes you and tries to walk past you, like, I'm just like, no, no, we're not doing that shit. Go stand back there. And, uh, you know, I'm not, if, they, if the same person came to me and said, you know, um, hey, uh, I was delayed, my flight got canceled, I got rebooked on this new thing, 
I, I'm really in a hurry. Do you have a moment that you could let me pass? I'd probably say yes 90% of the time. Not 100, I'm not that nice. But you know what I mean? So if you can't negotiate, you know, if you don't have a firmness of your personality or character during those times, how are you gonna negotiate something that's very valuable? And, and I've thought about that in terms of how you were saying it, is if you, if you can't tolerate the social pressure or you know, physical frustrations, like how the, hell would you, how the hell would you have that belt if every time you felt a little uncomfortable, you gave up? <laughs> how would that work? It could never happen. Gerard's next, and then you, and then Jimmy. What do you think of Gerard? One of the things that's coming up is um, about the importance of, of mentorship. And I know you yourself, you went to the best business school in the entire world, graduate highest honors, and Carla has uh, been taught by, by the, the best coaches in the world. I, I'm wondering, so in any type of endeavor that we want to get into, um, we want to find the best mentors too, but those people are gonna be at a higher level than us and are, are gonna be you know, difficult people to get the attention of. How do we engineer a situation where, where we can um, become their, their mentors, their mentees? Gerard, uh, he likes to say that I'm smarter than him, but he, he's got a PhD in economics and he runs the economics department of a, of a well-known school. Uh, well, Derek's very humble here, actually, because I've, I've learned a lot more about economics from Derek than he's ever learned from me. So <laughs> I can say that with complete honesty. We learn some things from each other. He's a very smart guy. Um, I think it sure helps if you have a reputation before then, you know. It sure helps if you have if you have an insider or to vouch for you. That sure helps. So how hard is it for me to meet somebody else at UFC today that you you have some sense of? I know quite a lot of people in that area, and how hard is it for? I'm saying it differently. If I don't I don't have anybody in mind, by the way, so I'm not setting you up for something. But uh, if you had a close friend or a training partner that said, you know, oh, I really admire that person. Like, would you introduce us? You'd say yes. Yes. So you know. It sure helps if you're, if you're that type of person. That, and if you have an insider that would vouch for you, that um, they're like, no, 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 it's not some random person. Um, if you do something with them, it's going to be a very good experience. So it sure helps to have the insider to vouch for you somewhere. And um, I don't know, I mean, if, I, if I go to any environment, I, I try to be nice to most people. Um, I don't go out of my way to be overly nice. I don't pretend to be overly nice. I'm, I'm very efficient with my time, but you know, it doesn't cost me any more to be you know, generally pleasant when, with people and strangers come up and talk to me and I'm sure that happens. That might happen to you once or twice this week. Um, strangers come up and say, and, you know, and part of my brain is like, you know, all right, what does this person want? And 85% of them are super nice. You know, 85% are, you know, oh, Derek, blah, blah, blah. You know, I've been following you for years, or I watched this video about blah, 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 and 85% um, are great. And 15% are really fucking weirdos. 15% are like, I don't enjoy it. So, you know, and when, when I have those experiences, I think to myself, when I go speak to someone, there's times that I go talk to a, you know, a stranger or someone that I know, but they don't know me. And when I go speak to someone, I, I'm trying to be very aware, like, how did I feel when you know different times when people have made me feel uncomfortable, all right? Then how would how would uh, a different person feel who is, you know, probably smaller than me? Et cetera? How would a woman feel um, when some guy that you know comes and talks to her and says, you know, oh, I, I met Carla at a public thing, and I, I said, I don't remember what I said. Do you remember what I said? No. I don't, I don't remember either. But you know, I told her, yeah, hey, we should do an interview together. I told her I knew who she was and I respected her, and we should do an interview together. And that was a while ago. That was um, half a year ago. And I don't know, came together easy enough. But I'm, I'm, I'm always very aware that I don't need to be pushy about it. I like to be direct. I like to be brief, <laughs> brief, direct. Um, you know, I'm calm all the time, so it doesn't take any effort for me to be calm or like, you know, not be anxious. I'm not an anxious person, so that helps. But if you are an anxious, per anxious person, Probably like calm yourself. Don't show up with fucking jittery, wet, sweaty hands and acting weird. And say, hey, we should do anything together. It's like, ah, nice to meet you. 
So I think, you know, good to be mindful of how, um, how you're making people feel. Be clear to them that it would be in their selfish best interest to, to cooperate or participate, that in some way you're going to be promoting them or paying them or somehow helping them solve a problem. Because nobody gives a shit what I want and nobody gives a shit what you want. But, you know, they're, it's rare to find somebody. Only foolish people don't care stuff about what they want, you know? So most well-thinking people, if, you, if it's clear to them, of like, oh, I don't know this person, but it seems like they might be useful to me. Might help me promote something, might be useful to my social network, might be useful to my future finances. Seems to be a resourceful person. It's maybe somebody that um, I should take a moment to get to know, make a further evaluation. So I, I guess I think that, that and an, an initial approach. And you know, if, if somebody takes the time, if you ask somebody for something and they take the time to help you, what do you think about a student? When you have a student that comes to you, you know, during office hours and asks your advice and you take too much time explaining something, you spend too much energy that you didn't want to expend, time that you didn't necessarily have free, and then they don't do the damn thing. You have a very different perception if the, if the student did the thing and comes back with a result, you're probably happy to help them again. It's true, like I th there's even a student who I'm, I can remember doing this and I was very annoyed kind of like of just the totally mundane and obvious questions he was asking, with, asking me. But then like he came back and like was like performing at a really high level. And, and then I was like, oh, this guy's serious. He's taking what I'm telling him um, uh, with, with, with absolute you know, determination and, and passion to bring it forward. And I was like, wow. Like, I want to help him more, actually. Now, forget all that stuff I thought earlier about him, you know, being annoying and all this. And actually, you know, I want him on my team. This, is, this guy's cool. Yeah. yeah. So take that lesson or take that thought in your head and, like, apply that, extrapolate that forward that if you're, if you're talking to someone that you respect or, um, you know, you think there's um, a collaborative future, that, you know, a mutually beneficial future together, then, you know, be, be respectful of their time. Somebody takes time to help you with something. Probably you should do the thing before you go ask them for something more. And, and, and the great news is, is most people aren't even competition. Most people, fifty percent of people are below average by definition. In any given endeavor, fifty percent of people are in the bottom fifty percent. Right? The next thirty, forty percent aren't, aren't real competitors. They're not actually doing something. They're just kind of fumbling. They're hobbyists or you know, fumblers kind of, oh, fumbled around and know just a little bit about something. And it's a small percentage of people that are actually competing for any particular thing. There's only, you know, it's a small percentage that are real competitors. And it, but it's pretty easy to stand out to them because so many people suck. This is my cheeriness coming out. Because so many people suck that, you know, if you just kept your word and showed up consistently and if somebody took the time to help you and you say, you know, hey, thank you for that. Thank you for that. You know, she's made several sacrifices this week to be here right now, and I've gone out of my way several times. Be like, you know, hey, thank you for that. I, I understand the effort that that took, and uh, you know, and additionally, the emotional control to to not complain about it. And I recognize that because I've been on the other side of these things, and I've really tried to go out of my way to show my appreciation for that. You know, that's a great point too. Be, be thankful when they do step into your into your circle, you know, they do make that effort to be there, be like, oh, wow, thank you, thank you so much. She's doing that to invest in, she's doing that because it's part of her personal, she's selfishly doing that because it's part of her personal integrity. She's additionally doing that because we have several people in our social circle that are shared, and, you know, I don't think she's even necessarily conscious of that, but somewhere subconsciously there, there's probably some evaluation of, well, we know a lot of the same people, and. And I have a great reputation, and it doesn't make any sense for anything that's not great to rattle around that group. And I think, you know, primarily, I think she's doing that because somewhere in her head she thinks I might be useful, and um, she's investing in a friendship together. So, and I might have those in different orders or disproportionate, or you know, maybe you'd argue with some of that, or I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but that's how I would evaluate something. Then I think that, no, and, and you know, I, I've taken that note. I'm like, oh, you know, thank you for, for making that, um, tolerating a lot of abuse and still showing up and, you know, making that gesture of friendship. And I'm the sort of person that remembers things like that. And, and, I, and I appreciate it. So I mean, I think those are, I'm being long-winded again. I'm used to talking by myself for countless hours. So um, what do you think about this? When you, when you wanted to 
you know, the right coach or the right something? Or how do you think about this sort of thing? Well, I mean, I, I totally agree with the show of appreciation. I think that really goes a long way. Um, but also, you know, initially when I try to contact someone, um, I, I'm contacting them because I genuinely, you know, respect something about, you know, the thing that I'm asking for, wanting their help or coaching or whatever. So I let them know, you know, hey, I, I, I truly like admire this about you or, you know, I think you're great. You know, I, I start off with that. And then I'm, you know, I would really be appreciative if you could give me this little bit of help or help me with this move or whatever it may be. And, um, you know, sometimes for me, even just, you know, bringing like a small token of something like really helps me stick out. You know, it's just like, hey, even if it's something so small, like, hey, you know, I baked these, baked these cookies, you know, I just wanted to show you like, Thank you. Or, you know, um, even as me as as uh, an athlete and, you know, people are always, hey, sign this for this, do this for me, do that for me. Like, you know, it's like right and left. But, you know, one person who will bring me like a little a little doll or like a little something, even if it's cost 10 cents, it sticks out in my mind because it's not something most people just want to ask, ask, ask. And for me, like little tokens um, really like stick out for me and show uh, a lot of appreciation. So it just, for me, it's like the little things like that that um, make the difference when I'm asking for help. And I think uh, people take it to heart because not everybody does those basic things. In, in her area of life, it's so ridiculous. Which you go to these big stadium fights, you know? At a large event, I see people that, you know, leave the, the, the fighters, even if you win, even if you win, good chance you have some injuries or you feel it a little rough at the moment. And, you know, you're, you're on pay-per-view, there's cameras everywhere. Um, and then you're, you're trying to walk down that, that hallway to go back to your locker room and people are shoving a baby out there. <laughs> shoving it. Um, you know, they're using their kids as a, as a, a prop or a, a something. Oh, stop and sign this for my kid. You know, and you feel it. Uh, again, I'm not trying to put words into her mouth, but my impression looking at other people do that, um, nobody particularly, but I know I've seen this, I have this imprint in my mind of seeing this happen so many times, that uh, sign this for my kid. You know, maybe you have a, a mild or moderate concussion, something's torn, you're bruised, you know, you're probably not feeling your best. You know, hey, stop and do this thing right now. I'm like, I'm like, all right, wow. And, um, and then somebody's going to call you an asshole if you don't which is kind of an asshole thing to do at that moment, or shows no empathy for, has no, no appreciation or no respect for them as a person, shows no empathy for the circumstances that they're experiencing at that moment. But, you know, the same type of person will be like, you know, that person was an asshole. They didn't stop and blah, 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 blah. You know, while they were, before they went to the hospital for their injuries. <laughs> so. uh, sir, who's after him? Okay, go ahead. In, in both of your areas, you, you both had to find the team um, and, and you've had to set clear boundaries and understand how you can bring someone on and at what point is it that you stop having that person work for you. What, what has been um, both of your experiences in, in that? A lot of it is reputation. You know, a lot of people have proven results already. It's like their results speak for them. It's not them saying, I'm gonna do this for you, I'm gonna do that for you. They've, they've had success and they've shown that with their results. But not everybody is necessarily like for you or for me. You know, maybe we don't work well together. So a little bit of it is trial and error, finding what works best for you kind of like there's a lot of different coaching styles, like what speaks to you, what helps you thrive more. Um, when I started, I ch ch checked out a few different gyms. I've been with the same gym for 16 years. But at, in the beginning, I was trying a couple of place, different places, seeing if there was something else that make, made sense. But um, for me, it was just, um, I found something that gave me success and I've stuck, it, stuck with it and I've invested in them and they've invested in me over the years. I, I'm very mindful about screening up front. I want to be very mindful of like if you're if I'm looking for somebody to fill a position in my life to do something, 
I, I don't want to persuade them to do that. I don't want to try to convince them to do that. Um, I, I need someone who's naturally inclined to do the sort of thing that I would like them to do. That their, their personality and their skill set is well suited to do that sort of thing. And when, when you start, and people will lie their ass off to you, by the way. So you're going to be lied to a lot, especially if you're doing anything substantial that you're going to be lied to a lot. So, oh, yeah, you know, I, it's, it's my passion to do whatever bullshit you want me to do. Um, well, you know, you're going to see their behaviors around that. And you know, so I, I like to find somebody that's already naturally inclined to behave a certain way or they already have that skill set. Uh, they already have a predisposition to be doing whatever, whatever the void is in an organization that we're filling. And um, I'd like them to convince me or I'd like them to, to tell me a little bit, like, you know, why, why are you the best person to do this? And if, you know, I don't need my ass kissed in any way, but I, I want to I know that there's a clarity of fitment, that it's a good fit. So, you know, why are you the best person to be filling this position? And if they can't articulate that, then probably somebody else could, you know? Probably somebody else could do that. Sounds like an interview process off the bat. I do that with clients. You can't buy, you can't buy us. I mean, hell, in this room it's different, but in this room it's how many how many hoops and layers and interviews and stuff to to be in this room, guys. Five, so five, six. Five, six. Uh, you, you can't go buy a ticket on the internet. Um, even to buy, you know, even to, to be in my, one of my three mentoring courses, one about real estate, one about stocks, one about entrepreneurship, um, you know, they, they fill out, it's a brief application, but they, they fill out a, a request for interview and um, they got to go through an interview. And if they can't answer a simple question like, you know, why is Derek the right person that you need to learn from? Uh, why is it important for you to, you know, you've been fumbling around for 30 years without this information. You're 30 years old. Why is it important now that you're committed to learning this? You know, you realize it's going to be two, 300 hours of work. You're prepared to do that. You have that time in your schedule. So it's quite the opposite of it. What, what do you say to somebody when, when you're going through one of those interviews and they start, you know, trying to ask you, like, hey, so you want me to give you five grand to join this program? Like, why should I do that? Yeah, I mean, at that point, if someone's trying to get me to convince them to really commit to their success, to fire them up. That's probably not for you, man. Continue with what you, you know, you've been doing. You just literally tell them that, and, and I, I tell them I, I don't want the wrong person to come. It's it's just a management problem. I don't need the money. I wouldn't do it without the money. You know, say that shamelessly. I wouldn't do it without the money. Uh, if somebody doesn't value my time enough to to compensate me for for doing what I do, then man, I, I went to sleep at almost seven in the morning yesterday. I don't mind if I went to sleep at one o'clock instead. That would have been fine. So if I'm not being compensated for that, why the hell would I torment myself that way? But so I'd like all of the right people to come and none of the wrong people to come. If they're not going to do the work, if they're going to cause a management problem or you don't want somebody like that in your gym that's like, yeah. Yeah, rather not even have people like that show up. Not, if you have to chase someone and try and babysit them, it's not even worth having them. So not, not only when you're trying, not even looking for an employee, but looking for any position in your life, you know, is this, you know, do you need a business partner at all? Is this the right person? Um, you know, looking for someone in your dating life, looking for someone that, um, in, in any context of your life, and I extend that to uh, you know someone who wants to give me money as a client as well. I don't want money from the wrong person. That's what happens in this room, Carla. Where you know if uh, if people in here say ridiculous stuff, or if somebody in here says something that you know they don't have the social intelligence to. You know, just, just be you know mindful and respectful, and just say some just some ridiculous stuff. I don't know. That's not fun. It's not fun for anybody. You know, we'd be excited to come back when somebody said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have a you know, you lost a fight. <laughs> you, <laughs> you only won. I, I I I don't know your record, but you know, you only won dozens of fights, and but you lost once. Does that mean you're a loser? Like, so, you know, I wouldn't want somebody in the environment that's going to be a pollutant or you know, doesn't have the you know, intelligence to um, just be you know, to contribute in some way. And I'm, I'm sure you think that way in a gym. That in a professional gym, you can't have you know, Henry Hooft is a like legit friend friend of mine. You know Henry, the kickboxing guy, runs Sanford. 
And uh, Henry's very fussy about who he lets in the gym or doesn't let in the gym. He's, I don't want to say things that maybe he doesn't want me to say publicly, but he's very fussy about um, if he doesn't like somebody for, for little reasons. If he, they might be very talented, but there's something he doesn't like about their personality, something he doesn't like about their attitude. It's like, he doesn't need them there. Nobody else is going to want them there. So just, no. And, and I think that makes a lot of sense. So just be mindful of that. A lot of screening up front. The more that you screen up front and find the right fitment, you'll have so, so little management problems on the back end. The easier you are on the front end, you're going to spend all your time dealing with management problems on the back end. You're going to pay the price one way or the other. If you allow those management problems to seep in, the gym you've been going to for 16 years, if they just open that to just any weirdo that's if the place is overrun with um, you know, people that clearly don't belong there, you've know, you got to have a talk with the management or you may have to make a de decision to go someplace else, you know? Yeah, most definitely. So it'll ruin the culture of the environment. It'll ruin, the, it'll ruin your whole environment. It'll ruin your personal happiness and peace to allow these people in your life. So make sure it's a good fit. More screening on the front end equals less managerial problems on the back end. Yeah, so uh, my question to you both, on your road to being champions, there's probably situations where things were less than ideal, or things were just like bad. Um, you know, from, you know, from your point of view, from your opinion, um, what were some lessons learned? And what was the one or two things that you think would have made, made the difference to help deal with that situation? As soon as you think you know everything, you stop learning. And if you're not learning new things and your competition is, what does that mean for your outcomes? So it doesn't matter what you already did. That's already in the past. And that's nice. Like when you have a nice victory, um, you know, when I have a nice victory in something, um, you know, I take 10 seconds to celebrate. And uh, I feel I'm like, oh, good job. If I affected the outcome, if it wasn't random, random chance, if I affected the outcome and it's something that I legitimately earned, but yeah, good job. All right, what's next? And some people, nobody wants to hear that shit. There's, there's, this, there's this delusion propagated in society that like, um, you know, if you, if you did something right, you're supposed, to, you know, you're supposed to take a year off to celebrate now or something. So, you know, oh, you made a million dollars. Let's take off, let's, let's stop working. Let's stop working and blow 900 grand. And then when we're, when we're down to only 10%, then maybe we'll get serious about, oh, hey, I'm getting low on money. Maybe I should do something again. And I, I just can't think of a dumber process. So um, yeah, I, it's nice to take a moment to celebrate. And I'm not trying to be stoic or cool or something about it, but my moods are very flat. When, things are, when something's going shitty, I look at it like, well, that sucks. All right, how do we fix it? What else can I do? All right, what else can I do? And when things are going really well, I'm like, oh, that's great. Sweet. All right, what's next? And maybe that's not, you know, somebody, maybe you'd like to have an emotional, if you want to have a life that's an emotional roller coaster, like use drugs, I guess. But it's not going to lead to great outcomes. But, you know, it, along with that consistency of, of compounding, you know, if you could maintain your emotional states and be focused on something, um, you, you tend to get better outcomes. There's nothing wrong with celebrating for a short period of time, but I don't know. It's, that's worked pretty well for me. Uh, for me, I guess it, one big lesson would be uh, learning from my victories and my mistakes and my failures. Um, I'm analyzing myself you know, constantly. I'm looking back like, what gave me this result? If I win a fight, I, I, look at, I still look for the mistakes. I still look for things that can improve. You know, maybe this person didn't catch it, but maybe the next person will. So constantly looking to improve, looking at the things that I did well and like, hey, maybe I should keep doing that. That brought me success. Um, so that's been a big uh, learning factor for me is just taking lessons from basically everything, looking back at myself and reflecting. So the, the question is um, both, uh, you know, you, Derek and, and Carla, you have, uh, you, you fit into, there's a, a strange overlap between both of you that um, it, it's um, the hair 
<laughs> that uh, for both of you, uh, a very significant percentage of your life while you're performing your respective skills, um, you know, it is live, unscripted, and there is a camera running recording all of it. So, you know, you can actually go back and, you know, evaluate how, you know, how you did a thing. Um, I wonder how much does that play into, you know, your improvement, uh, you know, of, of yourself going forward? Um, I mean, having, being able to actually like look and analyze things has helped me a lot. Um, for example, even at practice, sometimes my coach will tell me something like, put your hands up. And I'm like, my hands are up. I'm like, oh wait, they're not, you know, just even if I don't have like, let's say the actual footage, but just having someone to kind of keep me in check and, you know, have their eye on me and just that, uh, that secondary, those secondary eyes of almost just like filming and, you know, just having people invested in, in my success and growth and being honest with me about my shortcomings have helped me a lot. Um, how many thousands of hours of footage do we have, Jake? How many terabytes of footage? Terabytes? 40 terabytes, probably. 40, 50 terabytes, okay. So do you think I go back and review that or do you think I just go live my life? So for her context, it makes a hell, you know, she better go review that. Her coaches better go review that. Um, but you know, you're, you're evaluating, uh, you know, 15 or 25 minute, you know, frame by frame sometimes of what exactly happened here. Um, I'm never gonna see the footage that we're recording here. Most of it's never gonna be published. Most of it doesn't make any sense to publish it. Um, but you know, the camera's on to capture a few fun moments here and there and interject them in a, in a YouTube video. It's good for to promote her, it's good to promote me. It'll bring in more people like you. You'll like to meet those people. The, the things that actually make me real money are, you know, nobody's recording us making stock decisions. Nobody's ma helping me, uh, nobody's recording that. And it's hard to get good advice in those areas, so. But uh, I think it's extremely important to, to reflect back, you know, on the, I like what she said, the victories and losses, like, you know, what can I do better? And you've heard that mantra from me over time that uh, if things are going really well, I'm like, all right, what, what, are the, what are the key elements that allowed that to go well? And how could I improve upon that? What could you be, do better? So I, I like to tell myself, like, what's, what's one thing that went really well? Let's make sure we do that again. What's two things that clearly there could be an enhancement there? And if I focus on that, that I, not because not I'm trying to like trick my brain or something. I think both are valuable, but what's one thing that went well that for sure we need to keep doing that? What's a couple of things that um, we could do even better? And, 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 and occasionally it's, you know, they're not big things. They're like, oh, we could do that too. Oh, there's a little opportunity here that'll contribute. And once in a while it's like, hey, that, that was fucked and that was really shit. And I've got to really look at that and fix that, you know? So there's, there's both categories that, of what can we do better? So, um, and I, I've thought that way forever, and I wouldn't have got anything done. I, I think it's, 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 these are correlated to an answer that we both gave over here recently, that uh, if you think you know everything, it's hard to learn more. And when, when I look around at 100 and something, you know, world champions at various uh, endeavors that I've talked with, it's like a universal that, like, they all have coaches. Everybody that has a, a trophy, a belt, a medal, they all had a coach probably several. You told me earlier you have six right now. She's the world champion. We need all those coaches. You've been wrestling for years. Didn't you figure it out by yourself yet? Didn't you figure it out already? You're the champ. Don't you know better than them? What do you need a coach for? You know? So you know, all of them, every, everybody that's successful has, you know, has coaches, has people helping them, um, and is, is, is still in you know, an active learning process. You know, my friend Jake, Jake Shields, he's 43. Um, he had a great career. Uh, I don't think he's gonna go back to fighting. He's 43, he might do some tournaments. He's, he still does tournaments or little one-off grappling things. You know what he does when he sits around my house for days? You know what he does when we're not training? I'll find him in the living room, he's watching BJJ videos. He's still learning jujitsu. He's one of the best guys in the world at jujitsu. He's still learning jujitsu. He's still looking at little, oh, what's that fella up to? Oh, I heard about this thing. Let me go check out that video. Like quite a bit. Like I'm mean, not obsessively, not in some like weird way, but I wouldn't doubt if he watches, you know, five to ten hours a week of jujitsu stuff. You know, when he's not training pros, when he's not training other pros, 
he's looking at that stuff in the background. So I mean, that's a guy that just really likes what he's up to. That he really likes that, but he's still learning new stuff. So um, I think it's important to keep learning. But I, I, you know, I, I'm not going to go review footage or of whatever. I don't, I don't have time. I got, you know, there's other things to do that would probably be better use of my time. So I probably review. You know, sometimes I'll play. You know, five minutes of my own YouTube video or something, or just like, oh, I remember that. I remember that clip, or or seeing what, how the guys edited it, and I want to see. You know, does it does it look the way that I'd like it to look? So sometimes I watch YouTube. I watch myself on YouTube and remind my girl what a delight it is that she can both. Uh, she can hear my voice twice at the same time. Which we can watch me talking on YouTube and talk in real life, and it's what an immense delight. That's how she describes it, an immense delight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry, boom, 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 boom. Phil, who and who? Just on, yes sir. And then, uh, we're talking a lot about compounding before, but 100% effort is actually what gets you the bell. I guarantee you that the person doing 98 and 99 also has the delusion that they're going to get the bell. <laughs> but I mean, kind of, even though that person has that delusion, how do you yourself, like performing at a champion level, make sure you're not that 98, 99% and putting in that 100? I think just trying to stay motivated, um, just trying to stay focused, not letting myself get like, like satisfied with what I've done it's, you know, people are like, you've accomplished this, you've accomplished that. I'm like, I rarely think about what I've accomplished and what I've done. I rarely think about the successes I've had. I'm like, okay, well, that's in the past. I'm, I'm focused on what's in front of me. I'm focused on what's next. This victory in front of me is all that I'm seeking and what are all the steps I need to take to make this happen. It's all the little things, you know, you can do everything right and then still not win. So it just, it takes such, um, precision and such of your whole effort to make that happen. And the sport that she plays is um, both people in that ring, especially on a main card, both people in that ring are extraordinarily talented. They wouldn't be there if that wasn't true. So both people are extraordinarily talented. And you know the, the best people in the world ever, the best of all time ever, you know, they, they still get caught once in a while. There's still, there's a, a little void, a little hole, a little something. And you know, for the people that have such consistency in their performance, when you see um, someone you know, win a title and defend it, um, I mean, there's an extraordinary skill, that, an extraordinary talent that went into that. And um, I, I don't think it's lucky. You said you were, in, you were um, a wrestling champion or all-American Amer all wrestler in, Two years in high school. How many years did you compete in high school? Two. So high school, All-American. Second year, high school, All-American. College as well, yeah? Yes. College, All-American. You know, Invicta champion, UFC champion. Like, when you start seeing patterns like that, it's probably, it's probably not luck. <laughs> it seems improbable. So, um, but both people are very talented. And, they're, and everybody's becoming more talented, that you know, things evolve over time. It's becoming more talented, so uh, that's, re that's really tough. And that's why I pay the, the respect or reverence that I do, or I look at the belt or point at the belt once in a while. It's, um, you know, I don't know, it's tough to do that. Not too many people get one of those. You ever seen anybody have one of those accidentally? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Seems improbable. What are you thinking about, sir? Um, just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity that you've presented here. Um, I, I noticed from my standpoint, there's a lot of things where I was spinning my wheels. You've helped cement things and then put them into perspective so that the success before that wouldn't necessarily be achievable, now there's a path that I have towards it. And I appreciate that greatly. And Carla, thank you very much for coming to take, taking your time out to speak with us. We've gained immensely from it. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of us that have pages of notes we've been taking. So thank you very much, both of you. Um, the question that I have is, um, there are certain doors that um, achieving the highest level of success opens to you. So what are the things that you've done 
to take advantage of the momentum that that champion level of success that you've achieved has given you um, that will allow you to propel your success to even higher levels because you have been successful. How does winning compound? That's what I heard. How do we compound the winning? Or what doors have been opened that allow you to do even more winning in some other context? Or your current context? Um, for me, it's just saying yes to the opportunities that come. Maybe I'm a little bit tired this day or I have to move a couple things in my schedule to make something work. But, you know, opportunities kind of keep coming or, you know, offers. And it's just like uh, I, I just try to say yes as much as possible. And I try to make myself available as much as possible, especially if I'm not in training camp. It's like, uh, I can sleep later. Let me take advantage of these opportunities. And, you know, for example, even doing this program, you know, it's like I, I you know, potentially have the uh, opportunity to do that in the future. And it's like, why don't I jump on this opportunity that's being offered to me? I could say like, yeah, I don't know about this, but it's like, take advantage of these amazing things that people are offering you and doors are going to constantly open when you're successful and when you're hot and when you're on top but maybe after you know when that when that's not the case not so many doors will be open not many, so many people will want to shake your hand so it's like take advantage while while it's hot while it's going on i think it, it takes such extraordinary work to go build anything that you know anything that kind of matters or stands out that um once you've did that work, it's extraordinarily negligent to, to not maintain that momentum and what's the next thing and what's the next thing. And, um, you know, the, in, the, in the next year or, you know, in, in this year, in this calendar year, um, I'm spending more than 150. I'm trying to hone in on the number more tightly. Like, Half of the days of the year, I'm with a UFC champion or former champion, like half of the days of the year. And, you know, I'm training, you know, 15 days a week, a month with people like that, or, or if not, a boxing champion. Um, so on, on one hand, um, you know, that's, your brain normalizes that, that, you know, it's, they're hanging out at my house all the time and we're training stuff all the time and it's just normal that like, you know. But on the other hand, I, I, I'm never um, negligent to, to remember, you know, what an opportunity that is. It's unimaginable earlier in my life um, that I'd have access to the, the very best people in the world ever in that endeavor, you know. And I, I feel that way in other areas of life too, but I'm just using it in, in this context. So. I worked so hard in other areas to build, um, you know, some educational goals that I had, some financial goals that I had, some other social goals that I had, that I just see, like, I, I would never be so disrespectful that when, you know, somebody like that's taking their time to help me with something, is, you know, oh, my tummy hurts, I don't, I don't feel like it today. So, oh, I had a, I got a really bad, once a month, guys, I get a terrible headache. You've heard me talk about this. Like since puberty, I get a badass migraine headache once a month. It's really quite debilitating. And you know, last week was that day for me. But Hoist Gracie is home at my place. You know, did I bother to tell Hoist that I had a headache that day? Did I tell him, oh hey Hoist, not today? <laughs> <laughs> How many people would like to train with Hoist Gracie? You know, most, most current UFC champs would be happy to train with, you know. Oh, yeah. He's like, just told us to schedule. He's like, I'm in this country, this country, this country, this country. In six weeks, I'll be home for two days. So, you know, I'm not going to, it doesn't matter what, you know. So I, I just think it's, you know, make sure that you respect those opportunities. Like, don't just think about how you feel at that moment. Think about what, what, was the, what were the, you know, thousands of precursors that allowed you to be in that current position you know, what happened a couple steps before that and a couple steps before that and a couple steps before that, that, that you're in, um, you know, uh, you have extraordinary opportunities available to you. And then I, I think you need to keep the momentum, like, you know, respect that, be, respect your, those people, respect the work that you put in previously yourself. And, you know, your, your reputation is important, you know. If, you know, 
if I ask you to do something in the future, but you're, you're probably going to say yes. I don't even know what it is, but I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is yet, but I know I'm going to ask you to do something in the future. I don't know what it is, but I think you're going to say yes. But, you know, if you hear me talk like this here, and then you go talk to some of these people behind the scenes, people that we both know, and say, oh, hey, Frank, I heard that you were training with Derek, or hey, Jake, I heard, how's that going? If, if they say anything except a glowing response, if there's a hesitation in their response, you're like, hmm, I wonder why that is. You know what I mean? They, they're all going to say, you know, oh, it's great. So he had a great, great experience, comfortable. The guy works hard. He's smart. He's helped me with this. He's helped me with this. He helped me with this. You know, everything is going to be good. So, you know, don't f*** those things up. It takes so hard, it's, it's so much effort to build that. Don't f*** those things up. Don't be you're disrespectful to yourself or others uh, to mess up opportunities that are in front of you, including opportunities in the stock market. I waited 11 years for a great recession. I waited 11 years to have another good recession. You never see me more excited than when there's a good panic in the stock market. Like, and then you know, to, a good place to wrap up is with Tim's comment earlier, like, you don't go to war with the weapons you wish you had. You don't go to war with the army that you wish you had. You're going to go to war with the, you know, the preparation that you did during peace times. You're going to go to war with the army, with the, you know, the other resources that you prepared when everybody else was chilling, when everybody else was you know, at the beach, playing a video game, smoking some weed, yo. <laughs> You're going to go to war with the weapons and the army that you prepared during peace times. That's, all, that's what you got. So when you have an opportunity like that, or I think there's a fantastic opportunity in the market right now, I'm not going to mess that up. <laughs> I'm not going to mess that up. I waited 11 fucking years to have a good opportunity like that. Those are the times that you get to multiply your net worth. So the guy that makes a million bucks somewhere and then thinks he's going on vacation, like, what a joke. He's not even serious about himself. What are you going to buy with a million bucks? You... you what kind of property can you buy with a million, you know, in San Francisco, in New York? You buy like a, you know, a shitty studio apartment in a terrible neighborhood. So I don't know. So I, I think it's, uh, it's important to pay respect to your previous self and to the people that you're around. Um, and even if it's not people, maybe it's an opportunity like the stock market or, you know, some other opportunity like that. Like, man, you did the work. Like, let's capitalize on that. Let's make sure that we optimize the situation and keep the momentum going. There's more doors down the line. There's more doors in the future. More doors in the future. So uh, I appreciate your investment in, you know, in our friendship and um, in helping my clients to have some more clarity and uh, you know, creating champion outcomes, the kind of the, some of the gritty things it takes to be like a real winner, not the internet version, a real winner. So I, I very much appreciate you spending time uh, with me, with them, sharing some of your experiences and wisdom. And I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robbie. I was living on my coach's uh, living room on a mattress, you know. I ended up like just bouncing at a bar. I'd been a cop, I quit my job. And Derek Moneybird presents 10 Commandments of Wealth. Took, took the gamble on myself to become a successful uh, professional fighter and make it to the UFC or pride in that time. And am I making a sacrifice right now or am I just in investing in a better future? So it's easier for me to do those, to make those decisions when I think about it is like, oh, yeah, absolutely. I, and, I, and now that you mentioned it, that having to actually really process and think about it, I think that word sacrifice is kind of like, I believe it's the word that the ones at the top kind of use to make everyone else feel better about it. Because when you're at the top, now you realize that that was an investment. Was everything just golden and easy and handed to you, or do you have a little struggle with yourself along the way? No. Yeah, within, uh, in 2013 and 2015, I was living out of my car, you know, full time, and I was too proud to ask for help. Like, how ridiculous is that? You're living out of your car and you think you know it all. And 2015, that's when I kind of hit, I knew that I didn't know it all. So why not find experts in that and really shortcut that? I thought I was gonna just chip away. I thought I was just gonna read books till I was an expert. Mm -hmm. I never really talked to anyone that actually did it. 
It's been about a week since I've joined the Ten Commandments of Wealth program, and there's so many interviews that are offered in this program. I'm inside the Derek Moneybird Ten Commandments of Wealth program. This is an awesome program that you're gonna love. I'm gonna use the principles and the knowledge from this program to help me boost my leads in my marketing firm. Buy this program, it's a wonderful investment for your future. You won't regret it and you'll absolutely love it.